Okay, so here we are. Actually, the attendees number is jumping up. So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Jeff Burns with Premier Sotheby's International Realty. And first and foremost, I hope everybody out there is safe and healthy and well. Um, we got this panel together because uh, we've been fielding a lot of questions recently, and people obviously have questions about the real estate market, and uh, especially you know the local real estate market where I'm from and on a national level as well. So. We decided to reach out and reach across basically North America and find some of the uh, best and brightest real estate experts with Sotheby's International Realty. And we wanted to do a really nice kind of geographical um, swath all over North America and uh, try to get some really good regions. Uh, and we, I feel we have a wonderful panel here. So the panel you're looking at on your screen right now, and I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, this is a panel from really all over North America and combined we account for around a half a billion dollars in real estate sales on an annual basis. So uh, you, you do have some real estate experts here. We've all been doing it for quite some time. And, um, you know, we just wanted to get together and chit chat and kind of tell everybody what, what we're seeing out there and, and then field some questions as well. So if anybody in attendance has any questions at the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. You can type questions, the, it, you won't be able to speak, but if you click that icon, you can type questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. We may not be able to get to them all, so if uh, your question does not get answered, feel free to reach out to any one of us after the, uh, the panel discussion, we'd be happy to help. So real quickly, I'd like to introduce um, everybody on this screen. So um, I'll start on my screen, on everybody's screen is different, I'll start at the top left. So we have Ann Dresser. Um, Ann is uh, with Liv Sotheby's International Realty in Denver, Colorado. Hi, Ann. Thank you. Um, Ann is currently the number one single agent in the Denver metro area, and she's also the number one agent for her company, Liv Sotheby's International Realty. So that's Ann. Uh, then I have on my screen Petrus Engelbrecht. Pet Petrus is from Canada. He's from the greater Toronto area. Uh, Petrus is uh, with Sotheby's International Realty Canada. He's a senior vice president of sales with over 24 years of experience in the greater Toronto area. So welcome, Petrus. And then down at the bottom, I have Mr. Kevin Brown. Kevin, thank you for attending. Kevin is with Sotheby's International Realty in New York City. I believe he's actually currently in the Hamptons, though. Um, he is yes. a senior global real estate advisor for Sotheby's International Realty. He's also the number one agent for Sotheby's International Realty. So thank you, Kevin. And then we have Michael Schenfeld from Chicago. So Michael Schenfeld is with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty in the Chicago, Illinois. Uh, he's the top 1% of Chicago Association of Realtors and a global real estate advisor. Thank you, Michael. Thank and you. last but not least, we have Mark Parrish from the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, Mark is with Lakes Sotheby's International Realty in the Twin Cities, Minnesota. He's the top 1% of the Minnesota Association of Real Estate Realtors, and he's also the Twin Cities leading television real estate advisor. So we've got quite, quite a great group here for you guys, and um, you know, really happy just to have a great discussion about real estate. I know the times are very uncertain right now, and um, it's something that we've all never seen before. Um, and uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, I am from Southwest Florida. Uh, I am in the top 1% of production uh, for Premier Sotheby's International Realty, and also have been involved in over a billion dollars in real estate sales my team has here in Southwest Florida. So, well, I guess um, let's just dive right in here. Let's jump right in. Uh, obviously, uh, these are unusual times. And um, so I'm curious to see how the beginning of your year started before this health crisis hit and then how your markets have reacted since. So, Petrus, um, I'm going to put this one to you first. How, how does your year start off 2020? And then once obviously this hit, how, how were you impacted? Well, I would say, uh, I think a lot of your markets experienced the same. We had a, a huge influx of uh, foreign buyers in the greater Toronto area in the beginning of 2017. And I was starting to see a very similar pattern for 2020. There was, um, you know, a lot of similarities, a, a lot of uh, multiple offers. Uh, and, and the year was really shaping up to be phenomenal. Uh, it, it had all the, the makings of a great, great record year, basically. And uh, I, I actually thought about this and uh, I had discussions with clients at the beginning of this year saying, Let, let's go to market, let's uh, 
but I can see it's going like 2017 and uh, let's get to market quickly because we don't want to you know, jinx it. But in 2017, somebody flipped the switch in the middle of April and all of a sudden the market fell away. And lo and behold, exactly the same thing, obviously a different uh, reason for that. But middle of March, somebody flipped the switch and the market went away, you know, uh, for a totally different reason, obviously. So it was shaping up to be a brilliant year, one of the best in a long time. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and it's, it's now nearly flatlined. Now, Kevin, you know, New York has obviously been in the news a little bit more than some areas. How, how, uh, what have you noticed to start the year and then mid-March? Uh, well, uh, first of all, if I can just correct something, uh, you had said I was the number one broker at Sotheby's. Uh, you know, the field team uh, we've done uh, in the last uh, 10 years uh, over, well, clear over uh, $2 billion worth of transactions. So, I mean, we are, you know, are uh, the number one team, you know, like uh, uptown. And uh, so I just wanted to correct you uh, sure. on yeah. that. Uh, I don't want to take credit when I don't, but uh, uh, your question. It, the answer is that uh, we started off extraordinarily strong, just like uh, in Canada. And, um, you know, it was, we had all sorts of hope. Uh, right now, it is to say that it has slowed down uh, would be um, an exaggeration. Uh, it's completely dead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, we have absolutely, um, you know, no calls coming in. Uh, everybody is in a wait and see uh, environment. Uh, but, you know, again, we fortunately, we had a very, very strong uh, first quarter. So, uh, you know, we're, um, we're people of hope. And then, you know, what's valuable about panels like this is that you then can get glimmers of hope of what's happening in your market. Or, for instance, Seattle, I was just on a Zoom call there. And, and you know, instead of having five multiple offers, they're only getting two multiple offers on each property. But, you know, that, you know, it gives, um, you know, for us who are in the trenches, um, a lot of hope. So thank you all, um, my panelists here. Um, you know, I'm dying to hear what's happening in Chicago, uh, which we'll hear shortly. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's jump to Chicago. So, Michael, how, uh, same question to you. Uh, so in Chicago, we're seeing, we're still seeing activity. We are obviously considered an essential business. Um, we are changing the way we're doing, you know, business, but from last year to this year, we actually were up over 20% uh, from year to year. And with this last month, we've only really seen about a 15% drop off. So very different wow. than, you know, wow. and this is, I'm, I'm talking statistical data in the sense of what's going on with Jamison Sotheby's, our, our local Sotheby's affiliate. Um, so this is our, our whole company in essence. Um, so we're, we're still moving things along we're a little surprised that we're not seeing as much of a drop off as other places and we're still seeing people kind of adapting to that new virtual showing platform and wanting to get some things done but we also have a different necessity and we also are not a new york where it was really shut down so aggressively so quickly with a lot of people leaving the city in order to you know stay safe and stuff like that now, Mark, you're pretty close, you know, relatively close, closer to the to uh, Chicago than I am. Are you see, seeing the same thing in the Twin Cities? Well, you know, kind of like probably a lot of you guys, we're a seasonal biz business up here where our spring market is, is really our true, um, if you look at the numbers, the majority of homes that we sell during the year are basically between late March to maybe late June, early July. And overall, we're seeing uh, the market is down 21%. So we were actually on track, everything was looking great. Um, sales were actually up 22% uh, as we approached March. Middle of March when things started, uh, we don't have a shelter in place, we have a stay in place. Uh, however, realtors, um, you know, uh, mortgage, title, all those companies, we're still considered essential. So we're still out there. But when that happened, when that, when that stay in shelter, uh, kind of stay in place happened, numbers started going down, showing started going down. Um, we dropped to about uh, a negative, or I'm sorry, we dropped down about 3.6%, and then our current state right now is, is, is 20, negative 22%. However, there is still some good news in the marketplace with us up here as well, is Chicago. Um, days in market compared to last year are pretty much the same, 57 days versus 60 days. Uh, median sales price is actually up 6.2% on the Twin Cities. And then we're looking still right now, um, even with April numbers at our original sales price, 
uh, compared to last year is almost almost the same, 99.4% by 99.2%. So right now, it's, again, like Kevin said, we're kind of in that to be determined stage how we move forward from here. Yeah, so we're really similar to in the sense of having you know, sales volume and so on. We're, we're at 20.2% sales volume and we're actually up 26.9% in our transactions. And like I said, it just, it, it blew our mind that we didn't drop the way that we thought we would. So maybe that, you know, again, it's that slow and steady Midwest wins the race kind of thing that people are just, you know, comfortable. And, and, and so, uh, you know, if I can ask uh, the two of you, uh, are your listings also up? Because our listings have dropped dramatically. And this is the time of year that our listings are up mm -hmm. and our listings have dropped dramatically. So that's the other side of the coin side sales. So what we're finding is, I'll, I'll start first, Mark, if that's okay. Yeah, but okay. what we're finding is that listings are still coming on the market. They're just being done differently. So they're going into top agent network, they're going into the PLN network, private network, so that they're not actually on the true MLS. I know New York doesn't have an MLS like we do. Right. But we have a true MLS where, we're, where it's broadcasted to everybody. So what clients are doing is they're coming to us and saying, can you put this out there? as a real estate agent, as a professional to help somebody buy and sell, we just have to be more proactive instead of reactive. We have to be looking and searching for agents, which is actually making us more to, an essential to anybody out there that is actually wanting to do a transaction in real estate versus being able to do it on their own because they don't have the access that they might, have used to, they might used to have on just the internet and the different websites that they've go to and stuff like that. So we're not yeah, seeing much of a slowdown. In fact, I'm advising clients to go ahead and put their places on the market for the mere fact that it's almost like the Christmas market where people start taking them off. Why not be the best out there and the only out there so that you're driving all the traffic to yourself and getting all the opportunities. You have no opportunity if you're not out there for people to see it. Now, Ann, so you're, uh, you're our farthest west participant. What are, what are you seeing out there in Denver? So it's very similar to Chicago. We have not seen a drop. I represent Liv Sotheby's in Denver. We have 22 offices and 350 brokers, including the resort areas. The company itself has not seen a dramatic reduction in the last wow. week. Wow. To give a quick snapshot of the Denver market, there were 4,064 sold listings in March, reflecting only a half a percent up from March of 2019. So we have not seen a drop. Now, we're waiting for the statistics to be released in April. However, in Vail, Vail Resort area, they shut down March 17th, and they saw a decline of 40% because they shut down the entire tourism market and they made people vacate the hotels. So Vail, Vail has not had the success that Denver has. The numbers may decrease in the next month as, as a result of no showings allowed. We, ha we were considered essential until about two weeks ago. And then up until this Monday, we haven't been able to show. We've only been able to allow agents in the properties and no buyers until they go under contract. Wow. So it, my transactions in 2020 are about half of what they were year to date in 2019. I'm an individual, not a team. I closed 27 million up until year to date now and 29 sides in 2019. And this year I've, I've only closed 14 million and 16 sides as an individual. Yep. I do have great assistants. They're the real MVPs. I can't take all the credit. <laughs> well, we're kind of the same here in Florida as you and uh, in Close, close sales are an interesting because close sales are a lagging indicator. So, you know, for close sales, usually, uh, you know, those deals are put together, obviously, 30, 60, 90 days beforehand. So, you know, for us here in Florida, I don't have April numbers yet, but in Florida, the March numbers were our close sales were up 6.4% um, in March from 2019, which indicates the start of the year was really good. We were actually beating 2019's numbers, which were also very good and above 2018. Now, pending sales are, you know, obviously the leading indicator. So now we look at pending sales here in Florida and pending sales in the month of March are down 22.6% uh, here in Florida. So, uh, you know, we are feeling the, the pinch a little bit. We, you know, we also are a little bit of a vacation destination. So a lot of our travelers couldn't come down for spring break. Um, they closed the beaches, obviously, which are, you know, it's a, it's a big, big tourism draw for us down here. So that, you know, that didn't help. But, you know, we, we you know, we're not 
quite as fortunate as the Twin Cities in Chicago to where, you know, we've definitely um, noticed some, some sales decline here in Florida and Southwest Florida as well. We're seeing a very similar trend to, to Mark and, and Michael's uh, market where we have a very advanced showing platform uh, called Broker Bay and we can uh, list properties uh, exclusively there, more like a coming soon and it's not running days on market on MLS. And so exactly what Michael is experiencing, our clients are saying, okay, let's get, or oh, I'm advising my client, let's get to market, let's, let's be out there. Uh, but they don't want to see the days on market and we as brokers can actually see what's available out there. Just as if it is on MLS, but it can only be accessed by agents or brokers. So that's a trend that we're seeing. Our showings are down. Uh, we can actually see showings, what percentage is down year over year, week over week. So the same week last week as in the year previously, it's down 96%. So you're seeing, but we already essential wow. business. We can still go out there. Um, we can still do transactions and they are still happening, but it's just uh, made possibly people that absolutely need to buy or absolutely need to sell, people that have sold already that need to buy and people that have uh, bought already that need to sell. So those deals are still happening. Now, Anne, have you had any deals that you put together that were in either an inspection or due diligence period that have fallen apart and where they cited the health crisis as a reason? They did not cite the health crisis as a reason, although I think it was. I've lost four transactions since March 1st, which equated to 6.3 million. Some of these buyers said they were terminating due to inspection and loan conditions. I truly believe it was COVID-19. The buyers are concerned that they're going to enter a recession and are afraid to buy. There are fewer showings because the buyers can't go into the houses. With shelter in place, it's weeding out the looky-loos. Only the serious buyers are actively looking. But the buyers and sellers are cautious. We're still getting listings, and most of the buyers, most of the properties that I currently have on the market are active because they have to sell. Some of them have already closed on their next property. Uh, now, you're, do you think your buyers are going to react And as far as pricing is con considered since they uh, you know, have to sell? Well, the sellers are definitely over, excuse me, was that for me? Yes, that was for you, Anne, I'm sorry. Okay. The sellers are reacting over a million. I think they're a little more motivated in terms of price reductions. We're still getting competing offers for under 500,000. Homes under 1 million represent 86% of our overall market. Wow. Now, Mark, have you, uh, have you seen any of your deals fall apart because of this? You know, I haven't seen any deals fall apart. I've had some, um, we, we've got a, an amendment up here. It's a, it's a COVID-19 amendment that maybe you guys have as well, that if, if for some reason, you know, the transaction were to get uh, pushed back, that you would agree over a certain amount of time that you know, you're, you're still moving forward with the transaction. Uh, personally, I've not had any of my own transactions fall apart. I Yes, I've heard of others. Um, it's really more what I'm dealing with now is just kind of um, helping clients decide you know, what they should do, when they should do it, how they should do it, and just taking all the precautions um, to make sure that they're feeling safe on both sides and the buyer and the seller side. We're also, I don't know, we have TNAS. That's another, well, we have T, temporarily not available to show, and um, we also have um, coming soon, which both, you know, agents can see, age, uh, buyers would have to wait and see. Now, Kevin, in, in New York, have, have showings just completely stopped or, or you said you're just completely yeah for 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 the most part uh they've completely stopped and you know a question i think that you know we're all grappling with is not the uh, when we return because they're, we're not going to go back into a new normal phase it's going to be the new abnormal phase uh and you know that i think uh a successful to be successful it will depend 100 percent on how we face these radically different consumer behaviors you know, I think sellers are always going to be the same. The consumers are going to be different. And I don't know if any of us have, because we don't have enough information, if any of us have really uh, digested that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uncertainty. And, you know, obviously uncertainty is, is uh, you know. What, what, They're going to be the different. They're going to be different. Consumers are going to now respond differently. They're going to have, uh, certainly uh, the uncertainty is going to lead to, you know, more fear. And as successful brokers, as we all are, how are we going 
to address those fears. Uh, you know, I mean, right now, even if the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus disappears for a short time, now we're going to have um, another couple of different waves of economic uh, disasters uh, befall us. How are we going to, you know, handle it? I, and again, I don't know the answer. I'm just uh, posing a question to uh, this various, you know, um, polished group of brokers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, what I'm, what I'm advising my clients is a lot of this is going to be to be determined, okay? Um, basically on timing of, of when are we going to recover health-wise, what is that going to look like, employment, um, and also consumer confidence. So with consumer confidence, when are people going to feel comfortable again to be making large purchases? But I think a lot of it has to do with you know, boy, is this going to come back again? How is it going to look? What's, what's, what are, you know, what's the reopening going to look like? How are people going to feel moving about and around? So I think it's time, employment, consumer confidence. Michael, did you have a comment? Yeah, my question actually, it kind of goes back to Kevin, but also goes forward to answering this question. But um, it sounds like your concern is more the financial aspect that's going to move forward besides just the pandemic that we're in at the moment. Yes. Uh, well, because yes. I compare it to, I compare that, to, I mean, that's being addressed to me, but that, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, something's wrong with the voice. Uh, can you hear me? Somebody nod. Yeah, I can hear you. It's getting a little bit of a Yeah, I'm not sure why. Yeah, I'm not sure why. If your speaker on your computer's on, actually everybody, 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 yeah, no, I'm getting double, yeah. I'm getting double. Yeah, hold on, let me let me see if I can adjust something at my end here. Yeah, you're fine. Oh, okay, fine. okay, now now it's fine. You know, uh, you know what's interesting for us in New York, uh, which is different, and I know New Yorkers, and we always think that we're special and we're different. <laughs> <laughs> and is probably part of our being pompous and pretentious. Uh, but, you know, you look at, you know, uh, New York City and saying the best comparison is actually not uh, the financial meltdowns or anything else. It's actually 9-11. If you think about what happened in 9-11 and, and, you know, people were saying New York City is done and everybody's moving out of New York City. The real estate market's going to crash. We lost one or two percentage points for the couple of months after, and then we returned right away. And so we are an anomaly here. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think, you know, as I, I keep trying to not look at so much today, but saying, where do we want to be in two months, three months, in one year? And you sit there and uh, the word that keeps popping in my head is pivoting. You know, we have to, uh, you know, our business plans, our individual business plans, uh, you know, we need to be able to pivot all the time to adjust to all the different trigger points that are going to be happening in our market. Don't you think some of that though is also because of your, your, the price point in your market? Because like in Chicago, mm -hmm. we're seeing just, just like what you know, Ann was saying, we're seeing like that uh, 300 to seven, dollars $800,000, still getting multiple offers right now, still selling very quickly. A million plus were not as much and definitely not our three, four, five million dollar homes. No, I would say it's the, almost the opposite here is mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, you know, my greatest concern if you, I'd love um, someday to be on a panel where people say, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> is it the children? Is it the schools? Mm -hmm. you know, for me, what keeps me up at night is that if all of a sudden the wealthy um, leave, the, uh, leave New York City, you know, that would concern me. Uh, we have not seen that uh, in the wealthy and uh, that they're, you know, leaving the city and escaping someplace. And, and Manhattan is still Manhattan. Uh, but we also are a weird uh, marketplace because we have uh, 75 to 80 percent of our marketplace are co-ops. Co-ops, by their very nature, have a built-in equity safety net. And so even if, you know, like you have an apartment for $2 million and saying, I need to sell it. I want to sell it for a million and a half or a million dollars. The co-op board will not let you do that. And so, you know, and when such a huge part of our marketplace are co-ops, that is our safety net. I think that we are going to see uh, the luxury condominium market uh, take a, a, a serious bath, you know, unfortunately, uh, because the developers uh, need to sell. 
And so, you know, if you just bought something for $2 million, now all of a sudden the developer is selling the identical apartment one floor below you for, you know, 40% off. That's going to hurt. Our feeling is that we're just pushing our market right now. We're, our spring market had started. It was in full force. I think this is just a pause, a reboot, if you will. And we really look at that July, uh, probably by July for sure, but hopefully it'll be a little sooner, maybe June 15th. That I think people, you know, in as a as a culture, we're somewhat short-minded to what happens and what puts us out and so on. And I'm hoping that that's actually what happens here. But we are seeing so much activity right now, and so many people that are coming out of the woodworks, getting their properties ready for for showings and so on. The difference, though, is I think that in the past, somebody maybe would go through 10, 15, 20 properties in right. person. And we are doing so many virtual um, activities now with drone footage, which is kind of like, which, which we kind of look at as our um, thriller movie trailer kind of a thing. And then we go into the next step is actually doing a narrated walkthrough iPhone kind of showing. That's your first and second showing. By the time yes. the client's gonna get into that property, they're gonna be serious enough to buy. So I think the people, I think it'll weed out some of the uncertain buyers, and therefore it may actually make our industry stronger. Well, it's also going to weed out the, um, I'm sorry, and then I'll quit uh, hogging it, it's going to weed out a lot of weak brokers. But I, uh, you know, I keep, my focus is really on what's going to be happening in a month, two months, and six months down the line. And I think our number one job um, being successful brokers is to know the unknowable and to act very, very quickly and to be the fastest person, the fastest agent to act. We need to pivot all the time now. And that is, I think, is my message. And now I'll get off, I'll quit pontificating for at least two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's interesting, I, you know, one of my clients, I, I, I always remember his quote, he said, there's an opportunity in every market. So, you know, what, what I've noticed a little bit too is I, I'm, I call it a risk tolerance shift. You know, there's people that are willing to inherit the risk of the unknown, but they want to be compensated for it by a more attractive purchase price. Yeah. And it's almost on a case by case basis too. You know, there's some sellers that say, Hey, this is just going to be a blip on the radar. You know, this too shall pass. And there's some sellers that say, you know, I really want to burn the hand. I'm willing to work with the buyer and I'm willing to, you know, sharpen my pencil a little bit to transition my risk uh, to him. So, or to them. So, and, you know, Jeff, I, I was just on a, a Zoom call, and I, I, we don't have this in New York City, but all of you um, uh, draw contracts, I guess. Um, you know, we're lawyer-driven. Yeah. Yep. Uh, they said in Seattle what they're doing is very successful is that the, I guess, the seller is the one who's being proactive and um, drawing up a contract and bringing it to the, let's say, the buyer's broker and saying, here, $1 million, sign it. Like a reverse so instead of waiting for what's it called? Reverse offer. That's interesting. Offer. Yeah, I've never heard of that until 20 minutes ago. Huh. Yeah, one thing I've done in Denver is I've written up contracts for people that are they're afraid that they're not going to be able to find a replacement property. So we have done the reverse and do a reverse contingency in that um, I'll sell you my house, but I have the option of, of terminating if my next house doesn't doesn't close. So that yeah. they, so that they are, so they aren't committed. No, yeah. but this is being uh, during the negotiation. I'm told uh, it's uh, the broker or the seller takes the ball and runs with it instead of it being buyer driven. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I was fascinated. I don't know. I still have to digest that. Again, super proactive and just explaining exactly why the right agent an educated agent, an agent that's actually professional and doing this as a career is the right agent to work with versus like you said before, possibly weeding out some of the part-time agents, agents that aren't right. actually, you know, educating themselves through this. These kind of Zoom calls, webinars, everything else, yeah. if you get one thing out of it, you know, you're so far ahead than half the marketplace that's out there that's an agent. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Now, it's better representation right now than ever before. I mean, we're seeing it with other companies, layoffs. I mean, it's it's time for us to really be out there, be, be helping. And this is why Southern Bay is so far ahead of the, of exactly. the 
game yeah. because of the kind of the kind of agents that they bring over, but also you know the the caliber. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah, I agree. Now, I heard this. Uh, what we're going through right now, Kevin compared it to nine uh, eleven. I am actually getting a lot of people are asking me, you know, how I feel, how it compares to the recession of two thousand nine, two thousand ten, when we hit our our big bottom. So, you know, are, are, Petrus, are you getting that in your area too? How, do you think this is similar to two thousand nine and two thousand ten? Um, and well, do you think I would say similar. Yeah, I would say yes and no. Um, uh, and oh, that's I so would, Canadian of you. <laughs> no, I, you know there's similarities but we didn't uh, remember we didn't have the same uh, impact that the u.s had uh, in canada uh, there was a little bit of a downturn um but we didn't have the same impact so where i see similarities is just the fear and uh, fear and uncertainty that kevin spoke about um fear and uncertainty I've seen over the years in property is something you really don't want. If the market sentiment is so much stronger than even interest rates or whatever the case may be. So once there's fear and uncertainty, then, then you have a challenge. And, uh, you know, the uncertainty is when will the market pick up? So there is a similarity there, but it's not really similar, similar. And then potential deposits uh, that could have come from the uh, equity markets, those are now basically eradicated. So that's a, a similarity. Uh, but other than that, you know, I, I would say it's, it's not it's not very similar because there, there is, even though uh, it's far away, uh, there is a very definite end to this uh, when there's vaccines out and so forth. That we know it's in two years' time. Uh, that uncert that uncertainty is there, but so. We didn't have the same uh, uh, situation that you that you, you had in the U.S. In, the, in Canada, we were much more protected. Um, so ours was a blip uh, compared to yours. Um, so we, we don't see it as the same. I'm a, and I'm also you know it's going to depend from person to person. I'm a I'm very much a a glass half full type of guy. I want to see the positive always, but this is obviously huge. Um, what we've seen in Canada is an immediate pivot. There was an announcement yesterday. I I'm, love technology, and you all know Matterport 360 Tours. Um, so what they've done for us on our showing platform is, as of yesterday, you can, as a buyer's agent, arrange a showing of three or four or five properties, very Zoom-like, where you can go and hop literally from one property to the next, to the next with your clients online, talk with your clients through these properties on our showing platforms. That's how quickly they developed a new platform for us. And it's absolutely fabulous. So, you know, if you, if you pivot that quickly and you address the issues that quickly, um, the, the impact is less. Um, so it just makes me very positive as to how quickly they were able to, to pivot from a technology point of view. So now what's happening in Canada is you basically have to have a Matterport for every single property immediately, a 360 tour for every single property. And that will enable you to, as a buyer's agent, to show multiple properties in a row. You can actually give control over on that showing to your clients. Uh, and they can tour and you can just listen in and go through those properties with them. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the type of thing that we're going to have to do. Like Kevin said, it's uh, nothing will be the same again. And that's maybe uh, like... It, it vets your buyers. You're going to have less buyers physically walking through properties. That's what it boils down to. Yeah, but you know, if, you, if you notice your two qualities, you, you mentioned you're, you're learning, you're a great learner, and then you also adapted. Those are the, I think they have to go hand in hand, and, and good for you that you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a little more you know, bullish on, um, I think, the differences between 2009 and 10 and right now. I mean, Obviously, Petrus, like you said, this was a defined incident where in 2009, 2010, you know, the recession was a little bit more of an unknown. Why is this happening? What's going to pull us out? And then also I was in banking prior to my real estate career. And, you know, I was in banking a long time ago. But, you know, I, I know the types of risky loans that were flying off the shelves in 2005, 2006. And so when the market did crash, you know, there was a lot of bad debt out there that people couldn't recover from. So the market was flooded with. Um, you know, uh, bank owned properties, foreclosures. Mm -hmm. Since then, I think people learned a little bit of a lesson and, and adapted from 2009 to 2010. And there's not, there's not as much, way as much bad debt out there. People haven't pulled way as much equity out of their properties with cash out refis. So I think, 
I think people have been a little bit more conservative since nine and 10. And I think that's going to help the recovery on, on our end um, from, from this. Um, you know, I'm hopeful. And, and like you, Petrus, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but you know, I'm hoping those factors help us. Um, well, the other I, thing we're not taking into account is that people are stuck in their home for the last 30 days and possibly up to 60. <laughs> and either A, and I, and I hate, I'll, I'll bring up everything. Uh, they're really not happy with their situation. So whether it's divorce, whether it's, you know, a significant other, whatever, they can't work out of their house. They've got it, you know, now all of a sudden you've got so many elements, especially also if you think about even the... Uh, nursing home situation, which a lot of people, we were talking about this yesterday, a lot of people are going to now bring their families into their own home, which means that now our developers, our builders, uh, build properties yeah. that accommodate that, but also is going to open up the whole market. So we're going to have a lot of changes. The biggest difference though, it wasn't a financial reason that we're going through this. Yeah. So even though it's financially affecting every single one of us, I think that people will think about it in a different way and see what's really important in life. And honestly, it all comes down to the three most important things. And one of those is shelter. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Um, you know, the way I've been looking at this and what I've been hearing about this is this isn't a housing crisis, it's a health crisis that's become an economic crisis. And we've been talking, you know, I have people ask, like, you know, is this going to be a recession again, like 2002, you know, eight, 2009. And basically what I've been advising people is in, we're hearing this is going to be more of a, a v-shape it's going to come down hard but it's going to come back up there's a lot of to be determined how fast it's going to come back up versus 2008 9 we were living through you know like you're mentioning uh well, extension in their homes as piggy banks and that was more of a financial issue so um again depending on how fast we can get back with the employment consumer confidence and health hopefully we shoot back up here um it won't be more of like an l-shape where it went down fast and spread over years but you know with what michael just said about the i, I thought that was very interesting about uh nursing homes and how that's going to affect our real estate um business saying that if i was in a market you know uh with smaller homes i would think that you know if i if my parents were still alive um you know i'd be considering doing a home um, also, I have to point out that Michael, thank you. I just ripped up my nursing home application that I had just filled <laughs> in for myself. Uh, you can come live with me, Kevin. Don't worry about it. Okay. Older, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll with the beard that I have now. <laughs> <laughs> Denver wasn't hit as hard by the 2009 2010 recession as a lot of other cities like Las Vegas, Phoenix, because we have such a diversified economy. We have high tech aerospace, oil and gas, we aren't as dependent on one industry. So the housing prices went down, but they didn't suffer the extremes like some of the other cities. We have, we have a shortage, we have a huge shortage of inventory. So in the 2009, 2010 recession was brought upon, like you all said, because of poor lending practices and people overextending themselves. But since 2012, We've had inventory shortage in Denver, and we dropped into an extreme seller's market in 2013. Denver averaged a 4% four-month supply of inventory between 2005 and 2020. Wow. This is lower than the national average of six months, which is considered a balanced market. It's still a seller's market here. Buyers, builders are still ramping up in our area. As of March of 2020, we have 5,744 units for sale, which is about 21% of the inventory necessary to offset the demand. That's the same, that's kind of the same with us here in 2000, 2009 and 10, you know, the sales dropped off, but the listings shot up. So we had a huge yeah. increase of supply and a decrease in sales, which was just this chasm that created, you know, a, a, a big lull in our real estate economy. But in this one, our listings are also, um, falling off as well as sales. I mean, we, we are definitely down in sales volume, but we're also down in listing volume. So we're hoping that keeps a healthy supply and demand, you know, down here in our area. And actually that jumps, if you, if you all don't mind, um, we have a couple questions that have been uh, e emailed or, or actually sent to me here. And one's along this line. Um, uh, can you speak about real estate transaction from a buyer's point of view? What are they experiencing? Are they hesitant to put their home on the market? I think, I think she means seller's point of view. Are they hesitant to put their homes on the market? Are they resistant to people coming into their homes? 
Um, I'll jump on that one real quick first. Um, my answer is a little bit yes to both. Um, I, uh, you know, we're also considered an essential uh, business down here, so we can show properties, uh, you know, masks, gloves, the whole, the whole ordeal. And we still have had sellers, especially if they're immunocompromised, and I don't blame them at all, but have refused showings of very, very viable buyers just out of sheer concern for their own safety. So it's, it's definitely affecting showings and um, for us, and, and it's also affected new listings. Hmm. Mark, you want to? Yeah, well, I mean, we're safety up here too. I mean, that, that's safety first. And I think we've all kind of mentioned it a little earlier that the showings that we're getting, we might have, uh, you know, fewer showings. So what I'm preparing a seller for when we go on the market is, you know, we might not get five showings a week. We might get one or two, but those one or two are going to be buyers that are really serious. Those are the ones that have vetted all the homes, looked online, they've done the virtual tours, and those are really, really big buyer jobs. Are you guys seeing any health questionnaires um, or anything being requested by sellers before mm -hmm. before they allow a showing? We do an MLS uh, in our agent public remarks that we ask that, you know, again, all the guidelines set forth by the Minnesota Association of Realtors and as well as the national, anyone's feeling sick, um, please don't show up, please don't bring, just bring, <laughs> maybe don't bring all the kids, um, wear boots, gloves, and yeah. don't open cabinets, don't turn off lights, being I've sick. Been asked, I've been asked travel schedules, have, have, you know, have the buyers traveled recently, have they been out of the country, right. things like that. So, you know, even if it's not a health questionnaire, it's a little bit of a pre-screening that you know is, is a newer <laughs> thing. So, have you seen have you, have you seen any any sellers being resistant to showings, Anne? They they basically we have a, a sign that we put up on the door that if they've been sick not to enter. I believe when we start resume showings on Monday the twenty seventh, they're going to have restrictions on us. We haven't been told what they are. I believe it's going to be three people per household, possibly the agent and the husband and wife. And um, they'll want us to wear masks and gloves. I don't. We haven't been given that list of requirements yet. See, our problem, our problem in New York City, of course, is even if the government allows us uh, to go in, uh, buildings won't let us in now. Yeah. Uh. You know, and so you know, I, you know, and I mean, if I had townhouses, then uh, they, you know, you had certain amount of freedom. Yeah, we have very strict protocols in, in Canada and we, uh, before you will allow a buyer uh, or even a third party like a photographer into a property, they have to sign indemnification. So you docu sign that off to them. Wow. Uh, you, yes, uh, indemnifications, they uh, prefer and don't allow uh, children to come to showings and you have to have your uh, only adults and preferably uh, at the beginning one, but probably uh, two adults and that's it. So the, the agent and the two adults that are coming to a showing have to sign an indemnification before you can allow them uh, in. So, wow. The, uh, wow. Uh, protocols. So actually, uh, Michael, it's kind of a little bit along the line of what Petrus mentioned before, but you, uh, you had a, a question directed directly to you. Uh, said, Michael, how will you continue to have a private, the private marketing strategy for clients after clear cooperation policy goes into effect? When, when, it's a great question, but when it goes into effect, we'll obviously have to uh, take care of that and, and figure it out. Um, the value of the agent, I know I understand the question, but really the question kind of comes down to, you know, how do we, do we build value as an agent? Uh, because the private network right now is giving, yes, it's giving us an edge and that's what they don't, I guess, want the consumer, the clear, you know, being, being totally clear and transparent. Um, the thing is, though, is that they're always going to need us for negotiations, in my opinion. Okay, we I've done 800 plus transactions, over 400 million dollars of real estate sales. There, you know, if I buy a car, I buy a car every three years. Okay, I can't tell you what that contract states, except when monthly payment is and when I have to give it back. <laughs> I trust the guy that I'm getting the car from. Okay, yeah. as a real estate professional. When we do 60 to 80 transactions a year, they are going to come to us because we're personally referred and they trust us to get them through the transaction from A to Z without making, you know, issues that go along with it, helping them through any issues, getting them right professionals and so on. That's our value. So right now, the, the private network for clients and stuff like that works. 
But honestly, my sellers, I'm making them go right to the market. I'm not going to private networks because I want the general public to see them. I want to give them full exposure. I like the private network for my buyers because my buyers get an advantage. They don't have to compete against the whole marketplace that's out there. It's fantastic. You look like a hero every time. But that's not the way that the future is going to go. But they also asked me this question when I was interviewed in 2010, saying, are we going to be relevant in five years from now because of all these other kind of discount brokerage companies and companies that are doing online listings and all this freedom of all this information. And I think we're more relevant today and more nece necessary today than we were even in 2010. And I think it's going to continue going that way. But again, as Kevin had said before, and I hope this happens, we will have a really elite group, just like Sotheby's is, but we'll have a really elite group of agents that are handling the business and that are going to be able to project and um, bring this to the next level. You know, traders didn't go away because of day trading, because of, of online stuff that you can do. So people that actually need professionals are always gonna seek out, or that are professionals that are well-educated are always gonna seek out advisors for every level of their career. Yep, yep, I agree. And that actually rolls into the next question that we received. Uh, what is one thing each of you are doing right now to elevate the service and value you are bringing to your clients? So that kind of rolls right into that question um, as well. So um, Petrus, do you want to, uh, you, you touched on a little bit of how you're doing that, but um, actually, Kevin, do you want to field that one? <laughs> <laughs> let me uh, let somebody else go. Let me think about that because I want to give a thought out okay. answer. Well, I, I, along the line of Petrus, I agree with that. You know, in my market, we, you know, and it's nice too. And I, and I agree with Michael in, in a lot of respects, you know, being with a company like Sotheby's that gives us all these tools that we have at our disposal is, is a huge benefit to not just the agent, but to the customer, um, to the listing. So, you know, we're doing a lot of the, the tours, the virtual tours, and I'm actually um, designing a brochure that encompasses not only virtual tours, but it's, it's all a digital brochure where you can take a 3D tour of a property. It's a video from the Chamber of Commerce about our area. It's, it's basically everything you'd want to know with one click and you can flip through the brochure and see pictures. So we're really transitioning to a digital platform for the client. So they, to your point, they're so intimately involved in, in the property and know everything about it before they even step foot in there. You know if they step foot in that property that they're serious. Um, so that's, that's one thing that we've been doing. And, do you Same. have anything on Yeah, basically, we've been enhancing our virtual presentations, our vis virtual brochures, as well as Matterports, as well as making sure that they have every detail about the property before they go in. And I think, again, it shows the professionalism of Sotheby's and the marketing strategies that Sotheby's uses. I like the idea of the Chamber of Commerce. I think that's a great idea. We also will do walking tours of the neighborhood so that people can see the surroundings and the neighborhood and the environment around the house so that they get a feel for that before they even come physically to the home. Oh, that's a good idea. Mark, how about you? No, I've been focusing on our brand. Um, I think this is a time where people don't want to be sold. They don't want to hear about selling, they, um, but they're also looking for advisors. and. Uh, when this all started about a month ago, to be honest with you, I was a little, um, maybe like some of us, uh, not sure how to communicate. Um, I do a lot of social media, not how to communicate my message without coming off as salesy. And so um, I got over that real fast when I found out that people still needed us, want us, and trust us. Uh, so, you know, I've kind of shifted my format as far as, you know, going out and doing things a little differently, doing a lot of virtual uh, FaceTiming um, voice texting, but you know, zooming like we're doing now. Uh, so that's still changed. So I can't say that my business has slowed down. I still have people that are out there that want to do things. And now some people that need to do things, it's just the way that we're communicating is differently now, but we're still there for them. And that's kind of the message too I'm promoting is that, you know, if you don't need us now, we are going to be there for when you're ready. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's where, you know, I mean, we, I don't think I've changed anything, but uh, to answer that broker's question, um, a different mindset. You know, we are real estate portfolio managers. Uh, think of yourself as a, like a private banker. Uh, you you are sitting there. Uh, you can go to any bank and you know, like um, you know, do trades and everything else. But a private banker interprets um, all that information uh, and thinks about it. 
none of us, I guarantee that none of none of the panelists or uh, or you, Jeff, are interested in just selling one property. We're interested in making relationships and establishing relationships. And so that is what I think our focus. And we are all, I think, going back into, I mean, a lot of us, I've been in business for 30 years. I've seen the ups and downs. I've made money ups and downs. It's not the money that's motivating me. It's the relationships. And so I'm getting back to the basics, mm -hmm. uh, which I kind of appreciate. And I see it as a, a blessing from all this. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I agree a thousand percent personal connections. You know, I've, I've been, I've let my guard down, you know, I've been doing this 18 years, always was, you know, going from one thing to one thing to one thing. And this gave me this chance to kind of decompress. And I realized, especially in social media, that letting people into who I really am, my life, my, that I love to cook, that I'm a photographer, my dog, my this, that, things like that, that it's changed these connections, even though I always had really good connections with clients, that's what I'm taking out of this is that those lifelong relationships and how can I improve their life? What can I do to give them a better life by bringing them, whether it's homes, whether it's, you know, um, introducing them to the right people, you know, I want to be in charge. I want to be in, engrossed in every aspect of it. And that's what I focused a lot of my time on since I started. You know, and, you know, it's in some ways it's um, we all got not lazy, but we were playing a game of checkers instead of chess you know it's going to be more complicated but it's going to be more interesting guys and girls <laughs> you know it's it's going to be more fun i think uh in the end but it's going to be more complicated because we're going to have to pivot all the time but yeah. this network is what's going to allow us to actually also yeah do that. absolutely sotheby's is is the core i've invested a lot of the time in just speaking with agents from around the country and world to get those relationships really strong so that when this does go back to the new normal or whatever normal that is normal right the normal whatever it is that when they say you know as kevin was already but if they say i'm moving to manhattan i'm going to be like oh here's kevin's information and so on that's a value also going back to that other question you'd ask about on the private network these are all things that we have opportunities to do and it's just if you take them or not, if you take the time to actually grow that and if you enjoy that. And that's something I truly enjoy. I think there's two things for me uh, in the present circumstances is, yes, um, going back to the basics, uh, just literally calling your clients and connecting with them again. But then I feel strongly that one has to educate yourself as quick in order to help your clients in the best possible way going forward you have to educate yourself and become very comfortable very quickly with what the new norm is going to be i believe strongly it's going to be technology so it's like anything in the in the world like uh, the first few times that you do something you're uncomfortable with it you're not really there yet and you don't really want to do something and you don't know what how it's going to kind of i know it's going to be technology uh matterport tours and so forth and the, the quicker you become comfortable with that the quicker you will be able to help your clients uh, going forward so yes it's basics but i also strongly believe that one has to educate and then on social media then educating your clients about all the new world um and uh, in doing that i think that you would help your clients tremendously. yeah this was almost a little uh almost like a little reset button you know you get you, you get your same routines that you've done for you know that's been this for all of us have worked very well you know but you know to Gavin's point you do need to pivot and you do need to you know constantly innovate because you know you're either you know innovating or you know you're you're moving backwards so this is for me this has been an opportunity to, to I don't want to say reinvent but uh, I'd say add new tools to uh, what what we try to provide to our clients. Yeah, I, I, like you, have been building relationships with past clients by calling and texting them and just checking in on their health and safety and asking them, how are your kids? How are your parents? And finding out if they have any loved ones in need so that I can even send their loved ones a personal note. It just means a lot if you go that extra step. And I've been providing market statistics if they ask for them, been trying to keep it more of a personal level. Fine tuning my sphere list and streamlining my contact management system as well as improving my social media and being able to reach out to those that I don't talk to on a regular basis. Some people are more serious than others with regards to shelter in place. So sometimes I ask them on a scale of one to 10, 
a 10 being the most conscientious about staying home and not going out and respecting their comfort zone. Some people are a one and still having parties in their backyard. <laughs> you know, you just need to respect where they are in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I agree. So many people want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much easier these days. I feel, you know, like I'm not bugging someone right now. I, people want to talk. You can develop a, a really long, good, great conversation. How are you doing? You know? Right. Well, I think, you know, to, to kind of wrap this up, I, I'd like everybody, every, every one of us here to maybe give, if there's one piece of advice you could offer a buyer and a seller in this market right now, um, you know, what, what would that be? And, you know, what, what advice do you offer them in, in each of your market spaces? So I guess I'll start with Petrus. Do you, do you have a, a piece of advice or words of wisdom, so to speak, for uh, buyers and sellers? Yeah, look, it's uh, every, every individual's uh, circumstances is different. Um, I always think that about 30% of the market at any given time need to buy or sell and about 70% want to buy or sell. Um, so there is still going to be the 30% that need to sell and that might be a higher or a lower percentage dependent on what's happening in your specific part of the world. Um, and then with those 30%, uh, I would say if you need to buy or sell, um, you know, go to, go to market and present your property in the best possible fashion. And that's what I always say about, and I want to, uh, you know, find Sotheby's a little bit. If you go to market with Sotheby's and you have to go to market at the moment, that's the best possible move you can make because every single agent that I know in Sotheby's will do a great job for you. So, on the buying side, there will be opportunities, but I would hope to think that most of my clients are not opportunistic and vulture-like, but there will be opportunities and uh, get ready for those. Yeah. Mark, I'll jump over to you. Same question. Okay. Uh, buyers basically, I'm telling them to take advantage of the low rates. Um, you know, rates right now compared to last year, we're at 3.3 last year, 4.125. So um, as well, you know, inventory is low, but you might have less competition. Our spring market, we used to see multiple offers all the time. Um, you might not have as many buyers to compete against. And, um, you know, we're still able to go out and look at homes in Minnesota under the right circumstances. So it's, you know, it's still a good time to buy. Sellers, um, you know, typically uh, spring is our busiest time of the year. Um, we are going to see, obviously, more homes come on the market. So I'm advising people to like someone mentioned earlier, like during the Christmas, you know, don't, don't take your home off the, the, the holidays. Don't take it off the market with the holidays. Get it on now. Get it on sooner. There are buyers out there. The showings are less, but the buyers are really serious. You know, and, and the thing is, in the market, um, even if we got a flood of, um, of inventory, we're still looking uh, the seller's market. We have not seen prices drop that much yet. Um, so, you know, there's that question out there of like, oh, should I wait? Or a seller, should I, you know, what should I do? And I'm just saying a lot of it's to be determined. And right now, I think it's still a very good time for both buyers and sellers. I'm actually starting to get a, an influx of buyer calls. I, they, they just started um, mm -hmm. this week. I, I, I don't know if people are getting antsy from being home and they're, they're you know, hoping that this ends sooner rather than later, but it seems like people are, people are starting, starting right. to come out. Um, Ann, do you, do you want to? Yes, yeah, pretty much the same as the other as others have said. The interest rates are low, so for buyers, I'm just encouraging them to jump in. And if you're looking for under under five hundred thousand, you'll still have aggressive. You'll still have to be aggressive with your with your offer. There won't be as many competing offers, so it's a good time to buy in that price range as well as other price ranges when the sellers are more negotiable on price now. Sellers, the inventory is low and interest rates are low, so now is the time to put your house on the market and not delay so you don't have as much competition. And um, I might end with a brief poem. <clears throat> when this is over, may we, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, a taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find ourselves become more like the people we wanted to be, and may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. By Laura Kelly. Amen. Yeah, I like that. You Amen. probably heard it, but I wanted to share it. Oh, I, no, I like it. Michael. 
Uh, patience. Patience and trust your global real estate advisor. So the patience part comes in kind of twofold. Uh, the fact that there are a lot of new systems going on, there are a lot of new things that are happening, and therefore we're all trying to work through them. But the other patience that I'm talking about is actually looking out at your plan of what you're doing. So many people are very short-sighted. Real estate's not a short-term endeavor. It's a long-term game. So if you're going to look out for your short-term, in essence, your long-term, you're going to go and say, okay, if I purchase today, and even if it drops some value, what is my five-year outlook? What is my 10-year outlook? How long do I think I'm going to be at this property? That's the patience that you need in any market. Stock market's the same way. We're, we are a market where you look at what is going to happen when you need it five years from now. And if you can do that, you'll see the opportunities that are in front of you with low interest rates, with getting that home that you really deserve, need, want, because of what you've been exposed to during this time and the time that you've thought about. And so therefore just go back to patience and obviously get the right real estate advisor. You know, this is a great group, but there's so many great ones out there. And like Petra said, honestly, I've been at all these G&Es and I've traveled and I met so many Sotheby's agents and I just feel that they have such a blue heart, you know, as we say to each other, but they're, they're really, uh, you know, everybody's really top of the notch. That's great. Kevin. <laughs> I I think I, I would tell um, buyers, um, you know, assuming that they're not flippers, which we don't have in New York City, saying quit trying to time the market. Yeah. You're in it for, you know, like seven to 10 years. Uh, for sellers, I would say, what part of the uh, recession uh, do you want to be selling in? The top of the recession or the bottom of the recession? <laughs> Uh, and then I would also um, offer both buyers and sellers my Petrus dog. Oh. Uh, does he? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, <look. laughs> so for, for any buyer or seller uh, who comes in the next five minutes, they get this dog. <laughs> the Petrus dog. <laughs> all, the way, all the way from Canada. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we we down here we've been just you know we're we're of the mindset this too shall pass. Um, you know we've been through it before. You know, you know my area we've been through hurricanes. We've been through and you know it, it and like Michael said, you know and Kevin, you know if you're not a flipper, um, you know it, this too shall pass. So I think you know if, if you know just basically we want everybody to stay safe, stay healthy, and um, you know we'll we'll be here for you when you're ready. And so that's kind of the that's, that's kind of the, the mindset that we're taking. So, well, if nobody has anything else they want to add, um, does anybody want to add more, a, a parting comment before we go? Just thank you, Jeff. Thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for including all of us. And we hope to see all of you and give you a big hug in person sometime soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thanks so much for participating, guys. This was great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.